Hello and welcome to this new episode of the All New 52 Podcast. I am Joe. And this, no, that's not how we do this on this podcast. This is Caleb. I introduce you. Uh, well, if I wanted to change my name. It's not happening. My name is Kyle and for only this episode. <laughs> my name is Ultimate Caleb. I am Ultimate Caleb. What's the uh, what's the Earth designation for the Ultimate Universe? 1610. 1610. I am Earth 1610 Caleb, also known as Kyle. <laughs> and this week, we're jumping back into the Ultimate Universe with Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 2 by Brian Michael Bendis and the Bagman, Mark Bagley. Our, our favorite, mainly because he's the only artist who's returned, but also he's very good. He's just really good at what yeah. he does. That man can, he can draw a comic. Mm-hmm. This is true. Um, so we had talked about this in our second ever episode. Um, and now it's been a while. yeah, I went back and I re-listened to that just to familiarize myself with both what went on in Ultimate Spider-Man one and what our opinions are on it. And I figure um we'll probably be saying a lot of like the blank is still blank. So definitely check that episode out too. Um, if you know you want to hear more of our thoughts. Yeah, for sure. So I guess going into our synopsis like we always do, this picks up right from where year one, I guess, left off. Uh, Peter and Mary Jane are now a couple, and they're just, there's more villains than ever before. Doc Ock has been birthed from the Oscorp explosion that made the Green Goblin. Craven the Hunter has been introduced. He's a Aussie TV star. Yeah, reality TV star. Kind yeah. of like a very mean crocodile hunter. Yeah, that's a good description of it. And Green Goblin's back, too, at the to round it all up. So He comes back, but he waits till the other two are out of the way. Yeah, it's it's still a very uh, sh- interwoven storyline where stuff's happening in between. It's not, this is the octopus section. This is the craven section or whatever. There's... It's all it all it all flows together. It's but not, there's there's definitely more arcs. serialized than episodic. Yeah. Um, and I think the big thing for this uh, volume is that uh, Gwen Stacy gets introduced. Yes. Another six one six character that makes their sixteen ten debut. And I like this interpretation a lot because six one six Gwen is not interesting. No, it's has because no personality. She comes from the time when characters didn't really need that much personality Mm -hmm. and then she died and her like her impact was her death so i like and i think they lay seeds for what she'll be like in earth four five with spider gwen which is one of my favorite heroes so i like seeing some of the seeds planted here oh just in terms of what uh spider gwen took from this yeah she's more kind of countercultural punk yeah to a certain extent much more played up here um, then later on, but yeah, I can she's definitely very, see the she's seeds. very uh, going against the grain. Yeah, the, the razor's edge of the of the school cast. Uh, you get more rounded out uh, characters in the school. I think you get a lot from Kong. Well, he has one big thing early on where somehow he learns that Spider Man is Peter Parker or Peter Parker is Spider Man, and that was fun. I like I like some of the Kong stuff this year. I like I like the identity stuff that goes on this year. Um, you also get the introduction of Nick Fury oh, into the Ultimate yeah, Universe. That's yeah. a really big deal. Yeah, this is first time in. Had he shown up in Nothing Ultimates else had before this? Yet. Nothing oh, else wow. had started yet. Okay. Yeah, it's a and it's you know it's we take it for granted now because we grew up with Nick Fury from the MCU movies, but like completely different Nick Fury than what was before the Ultimate. D- oh yeah, the just military Nick Fury. Yeah, and yeah. This ultimate Nick Fury, he is the direct inspiration for uh, yeah. Sam Jackson. Based. He was modeled after Sam Jackson. Yeah. So. He's not the introdu- inspiration for Sam Jackson. Sam Jackson is inspiration for The him. Sam Jackson re- uh, representation of him in the MCU was taken directly from the ultimate comic books, which was taken from Sam Jackson. Yes, it, yes. They, they inspired each other. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of stuff going on. Uh, and then also just. Peter's still new at this. He's having to learn as he goes. And I think this is uh, year one can the the first the first trade can fall under my complaints about MCU Spider-Man, where it's kind of bumbling Spider-Boy, where he's mm-hmm. very new and figuring it out. And this year, he definitely comes into his own a lot more. Well, and he's fighting more uh, villains who are more on his level. 
Yes. Like, because he, he ran into, like, Electro last time and obviously Goblin, but it was mainly street-level stuff. Here, he's running into actual supervillains. Yes. So, he's got... There's a lot more on his plate, and I think the stakes are appropriately... What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, raised? Raised, yes. The stakes yeah. are appropriately raised for... All right, you two, we got to raise him up a little bit. We got to... Yeah. You get, we got to give you more reasons to keep reading this. Yeah, I think I'll get into this a little bit. I think maybe it's a little too much too quick, but I can't complain because I like what they do with all the characters. That's good. That's good. So since this is, I guess, appropriately season two, we've had our milestone. I wanted to add a little new segment to spice it up a little bit. I just want to talk about the art as its own segment, because I feel like that can also fall into positives and negatives sometime where it's a big part of a comic book and like, like the synopsis has its own segment. The art is equal. I feel. And it's fitting that if we do an art issue, then we do it with Mark Bagley. Yes. Who we are such big fans of. And I will say, um, while I may be, um, I may be just in my mind making this connection because it would be the logical next step, but I do feel like this has gotten better from ultimate Spider-Man year one. I feel like it. Uh, he's not using as many of the like. There's still a lot of close-ups, but he's not using the same framing. He's giving the characters more space, and I think his um, how he's positioning everything is more interesting. Oh yeah, the the Bagman. He knows. He knows the style of this book. It's uh, he hasn't. Nothing's changed too dramatically from those first thirteen issues. And also, I feel like he's gotten a lot better at expressions mm -hmm. this time around. First one had a lot of uh, angry and like sulken faces. I feel like that was the main face that he just kind of threw onto everyone. But this, you got, you can tell when people are like really thrilled with what's going on, uh, just like anger and horror. There's a wider range of emotions that he captures absolutely perfectly on every character's face. My one of my notes, I took uh during this was just that the first issue where it's uh, cutting between peter's new life and ox new life and it's just it's crazy peter's at the highest point of his life he has a girlfriend yeah. he's he's loving being spider-man right now he you know school's not going like great any, as great or anything but it's school you know. yeah it's school and then you just contrast it with doc his entire life has changed he's like a monster now and he's like having to figure it all out at the same time and it's just drawn so beautifully too. going off of Doc Ock, something I'm always impressed with, with uh, what Bagley's doing here in the ultimate universe is he's finding ways to like update these classic designs with both Doc and then Craven the Hunter. The only one who's like extremely different we've seen so far is Goblin. But even then, I feel like he put a lot of thought into how to redesign these very iconic characters. Oh, yeah, they... Doc has the modern update and he still looks almost exactly like his uh, his original 60s yeah. debut. It's uh, the only the only difference being I feel the big difference that you see is the arms kind of they aren't necessarily claws all the time. They can change. They're kind of like nanotechy. Yeah, it's a really cool update. They don't do anything too interesting with it at this point. It's got guns, which is something I don't think I'd ever <laughs> seen Doc's arms be. Where does he keep the bullets? <laughs> they're they're made from the arms. I don't know. The arms just get shorter as he shoots. <laughs> like a little bit at a time. They keep having to the mass is just slowly losing. Um, But yeah, it, 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 I think he really captures just the like the horror that is Doc Ock uh, like He's been turned into a monster, basically. Yeah. And you the first moment when you see the arms attached, it's just all this skin that's like melted and his eyes are just so damaged. And even and when he's getting his like first kill or whatever, the it's I just thought of Spider-Man 2 during the horror, the uh, operation scene. Yeah. It's, yeah. I feel like that was like it's very horror inspired directly yeah. inspired from the frames very, in Ultimate. Yeah. Very slasher in this and then obviously um Raimi pulls from this and of course his horror background in the movies 
Um, but yeah, very impressive how, like we talk about writing with tone a lot, but it's also like art has tone too. And mm-hmm. I feel like Bagley's able to thread that needle really well. He, he does it again when, uh, Ox just goes into this lady's house and just butchers her. Mm-hmm. And you, 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 I think, you know, it's Ock coming, but there's, there's just a certain moment where you're like, is this some monster? And no, it's Dr. Octopus. And he's basically a monster. Yeah. That's about all I got for the art. I just, I can't gush how much I love Bagley's art. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's so consistently good. And I'm glad he sticks around for so long. If we could get one comic creator on the podcast, I think we'd, we'd aim for Bagley. Mark, God, that, that's a big ask. Yeah, I mean, everyone we'd want would be a big ass, yeah, that's probably. True. That's true. So, jumping out of art and into positives, Caleb, this is your uh, you you. This is your first read of it. What do you have to say about it? I have I have about three major positives, and I'm sure I'll drop some in as we go on. Something that I wanted um, to just like lay out, and I don't know how much time we'll spend on it because it ultimately doesn't have much payoff in here. Ultimately, um, ultimately <laughs> is. Uh, I really like how he handles mutants in this, which may sound weird because this is a Spider-Man thing, but especially in the first half, mutants are a really big deal within like the teenage side of the book because they're, they have to do this social studies, um, assignment where they can, uh, present themselves as a superhero and the teacher gives them the choice for mutants and you get to see some of that bigotry play out among the students. I, the mutant metaphor is very, we've talked about this before. I think we talked about when talking about ultimate X-Men, it, it's, it's usefulness is only as good as its writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because of that, I, it can be kind of frustrating sometimes, but I feel like Bagley or not Bagley, uh, Bendis really handles it well here. And especially with like, What's the other Liz? Is that the Liz other Allen? Yeah. Yeah. Liz complaining to the teacher. It's like, I told my mom and she's going to bring up at the next PTA meeting. Extremely relevant. Like it feels very much like critical race stuff right now. And it's just like, I really think he handled it. Well, I would have liked to see the payoff in this volume, but I assume he carries that. On oh, into it, year it three. never ends. Yeah. The, the mutant, uh, racism, I guess at the end of the day is what it is. It, it is, ever present even mm. when the x-men become a part of uh the spider-man book yeah yeah like no one's ever really that trusting of them and i like because like the complaint i often hear is why do the x-men exist and people hate them but like spider-man's around and people don't hate him well well the answer is they do hate him and yeah. they do think he's a mutant so like yeah no one's no one's trusting a spider-man at this yeah. every uh I forget if there's specifically encounters in this book where he stops a crime and then immediately all the guns from the cops are pointing at him. I'm assuming it happens at least once because it's a very common occurrence. I don't know about that, but I do know at the beginning he has a run in with Jay Jonah. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I really like that and how he handles that. So, yeah, just no one's no one's trusting of this guy. You're, you're a guy in a mask in this uh, world of scary mutants. People are going to. Yeah, you're, they're not going to be open arms to you. I really like how much fleshing out of some of the side characters we get this time, because I feel like that was one of our bigger complaints last time. You got a lot of Peter. You got a lot of Norman. You got a lot of Kingpin last time. Mm -hmm. This time, you get a lot of Doc Ock. You get a little bit of Craven the Hunter. He's pretty he's pretty one note. I think he's like kind of a gag character almost. Yeah, it's it's like kind of setting him up to be a bigger deal later. Yeah, Um, but it works for what they're trying to do. Um, But. You get the introduction to Gwen, who's immediately makes a uh, like an impact. She's yeah. she she's got so much personality. She, she I know it's not her throwing herself into the book, but she just she really makes a place for herself. She's not just a copy of MJ. The stuff that sticks out to her at first has nothing to do with Peter. And yeah. that's what I like, because she's her own person. Yeah, she's then, not tied to Peter. Yeah. Then Bendis ties her into Peter, but he does so in a natural way. Mm hmm. Uh, MJ gets a lot more character from just having eyes for Peter. Yeah. She's she's like super supportive of him because she, she knows about the Spider-Man stuff at this point. She's the one who fixes his costume and is nursing his wounds. Uh, oh, you get you get teenage romance stuff, which uh, it depending on your taste. I like it when it's done right, and I think it's done really well here. Yeah. Where they're they're super supportive of each other. They're they're very much in the honeymoon phase, and but 
and then you have the stuff at the end when uh, she gets kidnapped by goblin and you, she realizes just like how insane all this is and how dangerous it actually mm-hmm. can be to be with peter um what do you think about what they do with harry when they bring him back i don't think they ever write harry that well all right um, i harry he's, yeah he the, the whole i'm very mixed on uh goblin in general because he gets more menacing and also more goofy every single time he comes back and it is i i'm almost done reading the entire run and it's like his fifth return and they've somehow like the stakes just keep giving dumber and like goofy in a good way dumber in a yeah. good way but harry harry's never written that great i'm still super confused on what his relationship to peter was before all of this that yeah. was a complaint i had last time and i'm just like were you friends? Were you just acquaintances? Like it still seems like acquaintances. You're good enough friends that he wrote you when you were out west, but not good enough friends that you never went over to his house. Like it, it just seems weird. Mm-hmm. Especially at a teenage age like that, yeah. when you're constantly going over to friends' house and the, their parents are at least acquaintances of one another because mm-hmm. someone's dropping them off and whatnot. And it's even weirder because Aunt May's like, oh, uh, dinner at the Oscorp. That's at the at the Osbournes. That's at the big condo. Like she, it, they seem like just kind of fictitious celebrities almost. And it is just confusing too. why. Why does out of all the schools in New York, why does Harry go here? to Midtown? Yeah, like just a random normal school. But I guess that's also just kind of always a complaint with Harry. Yeah, I think he's just. His 616 counterpart is way more wimpy and like it makes sense that him and Peter would have that relationship. This guy wears a leather jacket. He's cool, though. Yeah. So it it seems like it's just a counterpart that they didn't really know what to what to do with how his relationship is going to stand on its own. If you don't have that prior uh, mainline knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Another one of my positives is I really like the emphasis on saving people. There are um, two spots specifically. There's one in after he beats Doc Ock and he's like Craven shows up and he doesn't know Craven's like a bad guy yet. He just thinks he's kind of playing up this whole I'm hunting Spider-Man. And so he expects Craven to help him because why wouldn't you? And then Craven doesn't. And then at the end fight, there's a part where he's like, goblin give me one second so i can save people and then we can go back to fighting and it's like it's all super naive and stuff but i love the emphasis on saving people i don't care that much about fighting in my superhero books fights are cool but i if you're a superhero and you're in like a highly populated place like new york i want to see the emphasis on saving people and i think that's something this book does much better than most other superhero books. Especially if there's so much like destruction and collateral damage yeah. being caused it on the side. You, they're heroes. They're supposed to be doing heroic things. And if Fighting a bad guy is not inherently heroic. If you're saving people, like actively saving people, that sets up stakes because then if you can't, sa- like if you're too busy fighting, mm-hmm. like it automatically gets people wondering, okay, what's happening when you throw that like beam across the room? I really... I. I'm not sure how much that carries on when it gets into even bigger villains and stuff. It, no, it is a constant there. One of my favorite things about uh, ultimate Spider-Man is while there are the individual story arcs um, and there's even an afterward at the very end of this where he talks about, yeah, things are a little too like drawn out right mm-hmm. now. I'm going to try to, th- it, this is a afterward from Bendis where he says, I'm going to try to get everything like six issue arcs, like, writing for the trade essentially it's a hilarious like group of notes because it's basically him just being like i've had conversations with the editor and i explained to them why i was right and they were wrong and they all agreed with me (laughs) uh but there's always if not issues dedicated to some small time saving thing he's always popping in for a second doing something good saving a person stopping Mm -hmm. an old lady from getting run over in the street all that is always going on and it is the stakes just go higher. Yeah. In every fight, there's always something going. There's all it's never just about the fight. There's always an external thing that he has to worry about. Going back to the side characters, uh, Kong has a revelation about Peter being Spider-Man. You also find out a lot of people have figured out he's Spider-Man because I mean it's kind of obvious. You you think about it, you just think about it hard enough. When, mo- it, when, when most of your villains are like super scientists, 
they can put two and three together. Yeah, they all and you have Kong, who's just he's a nitwit. Honestly, he's just a big doofus. And he just think he just thinks about it for a little bit. He's like, eh, yeah, it lines up. But no one believes him. Well, he's not caught up. That's why I like Kong is that Kong is just he's with the popular kids for some reason, but he never like worries about being popular. So, of course, he's going to think about it. When at when like Flash and Liz, they're like, no, Peter's not popular, so he couldn't be Spider Man. He's just a loser. Yeah, uh, Nick Fury gets introduced, and okay, yeah, he's the he he's the super spy or whatever. But I think I like that at that point, you've already had multiple other people figure it out. So yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah of course the uh, the ultra spy would know. It's not like he's been doing a good job of keeping it hidden, and. It's also a complaint for me at the same time because I, I don't like everyone in the world knowing that he's Spider-Man. It just the dual identity is a big part of it. But I. I do like in that in this own separate Ultimate Universe thing that they're able to. Do a story about this. Yeah. And make it believable at the same time. Do you have any more positives to go off on? Yeah, I have one more, and it's kind of my biggest, so I thought I'd save it for last. Um, I don't read a ton of Spider-Man. If I do, it's mainly for this podcast and because Joe gave it to me. Um, but I do, you know, it's not because I dislike Spider-Man. So I just wanted to preface that by being like, I don't have the pool of Spider-Man that someone like Joe has. However, I think that the issue where he fights Doc Ock in this, and then he has the interview with the... Um, reporters, I think that is the best Spider-Man I've ever read. It just perfectly <laughs> really good. Yeah, it like captures what he's able to do power wise. But then with that interview and then with him, like I was talking before, trying to save people, um, even though Craven's coming to attack him, it just shows his values. It shows his priorities. Bendis understands Spider-Man. And I feel like because I've read that, I understand Spider-Man more now. Like, you know, I, I, I don't not understand Spider-Man. He's <laughs> the most popular Marvel character. But, like, I, I get it more, you know? Because you, you see it in practice. Yeah. I want to... I I didn't want to just, like, start listing off positives that, like, I listed last time. Because, frankly, I don't remember them. And, frankly, most of them are the same. Peter's characterized great and whatnot. So, I guess we'll just go into negatives. I... Mine are less negatives and more like... This is a choice. <laughs> Uh, Norman coming back so soon, I feel like he's a little bit rushed and especially with the advancements, I guess you'd call them. Uh, he's now sentient of what is going on. He can trigger it with like a form, like an, just an immediate injection and it happens and he just knows everything. Like he has figured out Peter Spider-Man fine. So have a billion other people at this point. Uh, he keeps his hood behind his desk a little much you didn't like the hood last time either like <laughs> well no the, i think the hood's goofy the fact that he keeps it like up on the wall yeah, is yeah. hilariously goofy because it's just like it's just like a trash bag <laughs> i definitely think that's the weaker story in this year um and to be honest it was the weaker story last time too but at least last time like they had the excuse of we're setting him up. Mm -hmm. You've set him up now. Like he should be like super and he is a threat. Don't oh, get me yeah. wrong, but he still, I don't really, I feel like we needed to spend more time building up to him and more time of him just existing and that looming over Peter. Yeah. The, the fact that he's back and you immediately, he's just the goblin again. He's not a threatening Norman Osborne figure, which I feel like Norman is threatening enough on his own his own he's just a powerful businessman who's like slimy yeah and enough threatening going on and i feel like he could carry his own before you have to get, get the goblin back in the story and just with my like knowledge of what comes after i i don't like immediately the raising of the stakes and it's like and they, and they have to get more every single time to keep him being this uh this looming threat so you know, just just don't do it so early. Just don't have him be such an immediate threat. And also just Harry coming back into the fold and not making any sense. And then you have this hokey. Ah, oh, his therapist has actually been hypnotizing him to not believe anything. It's like uh, like it's comics. I get they're going to have weird stuff like this, but, but what? Mm -hmm. Um, I like or no, I don't like we're doing the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. I 
don't like how many I feel like it's a little crowded at the beginning of this. Um how so? Just there are too many like having Doc Ock and Craven pop up in the same issue, like be introduced, it's a little too much. Now that's not as big a problem in the resolution because Craven like is a one hit knockout. Yeah, he's just um, a guy. Yeah. But I felt like building up to that, it's like, okay, there is a lot going on for a comic whose biggest threat up before this was Goblin, and that's it. Like, you know. Craven, I think, is introduced. I like him being introduced as just a guy at first. I don't like him being interwoven into the Doc Ock stuff, especially because he's just a guy. He's yeah. just a TV star. This would have been a great, like, two issues to itself. Him being, like, split in between and having his own cutaways where he seems like a looming threat or anything. He's not. He's just a guy. Mm-hmm. And, but, so. And just, like, that also, around there, you also see, like, you see Sandman get seated, and he doesn't actually do anything, but it's just like, oh, everything in Spider-Man is crashing down all at once. It's all connected to Oscorp. Oscorp is the big. Or Hammer. Yeah, I've, I've completely forgot about Justin Hammer in such an Osborne-centric uh, 1610. And with such a, like, different interpretation of Hammer, it's just, there's a lot of characters. Is this, because I, I I don't know who Hammer, like, I have no idea what his personality is in 616. Uh, old, old wimpy man isn't what I normally pin him for and okay. see him as. He's usually more, like, savvy businessman. But... Yeah, and then you you do have the shield stuff coming in. It does. It can feel a little crowded at times. Super small nitpick. You have a agent. You have an agent of shield. I almost said agents of shield. <laughs> um, you have an agent who is a female and has red hair and is not Black Widow. No, it's Sharon Carter. It's Sharon Carter. Yeah, but like, I feel like it would just be smarter to like give her a different hairstyle when like the most famous shield agent. Her look has is red awful. Hair. Too. just the glass the it's sunglasses just, it's very 90s it's, it's very so x silly. files <laughs> yeah it's it is what it is i'm trying to think if there's anything more I, I, any anything i talk about is it's like it's not nothing to bring the book down because it's just like eh, like you could have done some things a little different i think doc ox a little weak i like him as a physical threat but i don't like he's introduced in year one but just very briefly um but i don't know his personality i don't know like they talk about how he has amnesia and he's not himself i don't know how much of that is him and how much of it is his amnesia and his trauma like i feel like they could have set him up a little better i think if he was a one note villain where this was this is the doc off ox stuff you're gonna get then yes it would be lacking I think it does a good job of showing like what a threat he can be when he doesn't really know what's going on. Mm. Cause like he's amnesiac. He's kind of figuring it all out as he goes. And he's just like mad with sen- no sense of self or direction right now. He- he's acting on instinct primarily. And a lot of it has to do with the arms uh, and just being freaked out at his circumstances. The way he comes back in contrast to goblin, I think is way better in there's longer gaps of uh, absence with him. And when he comes back, the stakes are raised appropriately. I like that because he's always been my favorite Spider-Man villain, mainly because of Alfred Molina um, in Spider-Man two. So I, it's, I like that if you give this to me again and he comes back, then I'll be like, Oh cool. More cool. Doc Ock, more Doc Ock or yeah, more, Doc Ock, but now he's cool. Now he's yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's they do a lot with him. I mean, once again, uh, like we talked about last time, just some dated language and stuff. Like uh, it feels very two thousands, um, but as like a period piece, it kind of works. Yeah, going back into uh, the tiny little bit of positive that is no no fault of the book at this point, but kind of a fault later on. It's it's so nice because I'm currently reading more of it. It's so nice coming back and reading this and it's still being very just Spider-Man. It's Spider-Man and his rogues and his cast of characters and no one else. Yeah. And it doesn't stay like that for too much longer, unfortunately. And that's why it's so cool when Nick Fury comes in, because it's like, oh, this is something new. Yeah. And but if that's happening all the time. Yeah. yeah. Loses it, loses its sparkle a little bit. All right. Well, that's all I have to say. That's Uh, it, too. I think. 
probably as a cohesive story, year one is a little bit tighter. Um, but I, I enjoyed this a lot. So as a sequel, I think this, uh, builds on what made year one good and just makes it better. Mm -hmm. And I think it only, only goes up for, from here for a little while. I take that back. There's a slight dip next, but it goes up after that. Venom. Yeah. Yeah. Let the devil in. (laughs) Do you have something for me? I do. I want to begin by apologizing to you, Joe. What? Is is this? Is, oh no! Is this themed? Yes or no? Because if it's if it's if the, it's themed the and color. it's red. So wait, what is it? Oh, Hawksbox. There is a event going on around the time that this uh, video or this episode, upcoming episode, will be released. Inferno. Inferno. Oh, red. Red. Yes. We are going to be reading the lead up to Inferno, which is some of Hawkspox. I'll talk you through that after we're off camera. And then two issues of Jonathan Hickman's X-Men series. This is mainly for those of you who have been kind of keeping up with it. Mainly we're following Mystique's storyline leading into Inferno um, and touching on more Rubik Taggarts. So it's going to be a little bit more scattered, but it does tell one cohesive story. Okay. I but thought it was I, Dark Phoenix for a second with the red. I was like, oh, no. This, oh, no. We've set up a rule about how long things can be. The, I, I, the rule's going to get broken at some point. I feel like Dark Phoenix is going to be it, if anything is. If anything, Dark Phoenix is going to be our finale, like in 10 years or whenever. This, <laughs> this show isn't going to go for 10 years. Whenever we end it, I feel like that's that's the comic we'll need to end it on. As always, if you've liked what you've heard, uh, please rate us good on the podcast platform on your, of your choice. Five stars is great. Gets us up in the charts. If you want to recommend us stuff or just critique us directly where we will see it, email us at allnew52podcast at gmail.com. If, yeah, and if you have any suggestions, that's the suggestions place to send them. To, yeah. Did I say that or did I not? Uh, you might have. Well, you'll find out when you edit this. All right, cool. Uh, we're reading lead up to inferno i guess i don't know how i'm gonna title this next one inferno prelude yeah that's a good name the uh the embers of inferno (laughs) i feel like that's a trivium album i think it actually might be just sign off (laughs) this has been all new 52 and we'll see you next time bye